Good morning, all. Um, welcome to the Zoom call. Uh, we're going to wait for another couple of minutes uh, for folks who are just popping on, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, all, and thank you for joining us. My name is John Surick. I'm Director of Media Relations at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, I want you all to note that you will be on mute until we get to the Q&A portion of the, of the event. Uh, the Zoom call is being recorded, and that recording will be available on our website approximately two hours after uh, the call was over. Uh, Beth McGee, who is our Director of Science and Agricultural Policy, is going to give an overview on the report and the conclusions and recommendations. Denise Stranko, who is our Federal Executive Director, is going to talk about our efforts in Washington to uh, pursue additional conservation funding. And then we're going to hear from state specialist, ag specialists, Bill Chain, our senior Pennsylvania Senior Agriculture Program Manager, uh, our Maryland Restoration Biologist, Rob Schnabel, and the Virginia Watershed Restoration Scientist, Matt Kowalski. They're gonna provide uh, state perspectives on, uh, on conser uh, conservation efforts. A uh, couple of housekeeping I keeping items. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, let me know your name, your affiliation, and who you'd like to address the question to. You don't need to type in the whole question. Uh, and we're reserving the chat function. If for some reason you have technical difficulties, uh, use the chat function to communicate with us and uh, let us know what your problems are. With that, we go ahead and get started with uh, Beth McGee. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, John. Again, Beth McGee, Director of Science and Agricultural Policy at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay states have only until 2025 to implement the pollution reduction measures that are called for in the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. Uh, the blueprint was established in 2010 um, with, by EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the watershed states. And it included watershed-wide limits for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, and then state-specific plans designed to achieve those limits. Um, roughly 80% of the remaining pollution reductions right now are to come from agriculture. And while we definitely have made progress, um, all the states must implement, must accelerate implementation to meet these commitments. Um, and Pennsylvania in particular is the state that is the furthest behind. Uh, the task is daunting, but as highlighted in our Farm Forward report, many of the same conservation practices that we're relying on to achieve our water quality goals also help reduce greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change, result in healthier farms and soils that are resilient to weather extremes and have economic benefits to both farmers and our rural economies. For example, regenerative agricultural practices such as rotational grazing, which is where you uh, create paddocks in a pasture and move animals among those paddocks, uh, planting forest buffers along streams, minimizing soil disturbances from plowing and tilling, and planting winter cover crops all reduce farm runoff, but also um, are considered climate smart practices. These practices, for example, can sequester carbon by building soil organic matter and, and healthy soils, uh, living trees and having living plants can sequester, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it in leaves, branches, and stems of, of our plants. Healthy soils will increase the land's ability to filter and retain water, making farms and communities more resilient to droughts and floods. Uh, adoption of these practices can also reduce the use of fertilizer. If we put less nitrogen on the ground, either in the form of manure 
or synthetic fertilizer, we will reduce the amount of nitrous oxide that is produced and nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas. Another benefit of these practices is that often the use of farm equipment like tractors is reduced and that's gonna reduce uh, the emissions of combust or fossil fuels, emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion. In our report, we have four real life, real life examples of farms that had converted to rotational grazing. This was part of a CBF led multi-year study where we quantify the environmental benefits of this conversion. Uh, using farm scale tools to estimate water quality and greenhouse gas benefits, we found that loads of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment fell an average of 63%, 67%, and 47% respectively um, across the farms in which we worked, and that net greenhouse gas emissions from the farm study fell an average of 42%. Investing in conservation also pays dividends for farmers. As you'll see from the, feed, the producers that are highlighted in this report, um, they give examples of reducing livestock feed costs, fertilizer costs, and all noted uh, an improvement in, in wildlife habitat on their farms. Other case studies from across the country, for example, one by the American Farmland Trust, which quantified economic benefits of healthy soil practices to row crop farmers in New York Illinois and California found that their bottom line increased by roughly $37 per acre per year by implementing these practices. And then other studies throughout the country have indicated that healthy soil practices like conservation tillage, planting winter cover crops, nutrient management, reduce the use of costly fertilizers and pesticides. Another important practice contained within the state's cleanup plans are planting forested buffers along streams and waterways. These buffers will reduce the amount of pollution that enters our waterways, but they also sequester carbon dioxide, provide habitat for wildlife, and help reduce stream temperatures by shading the streams. The Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint, so the state cleanup plans collectively call for a total of 190,500 acres of buffers by 2025. We estimate that the carbon dioxide benefits of these buffers, that these buffers would remove roughly 173,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere annually. That's the equivalent of the annual emissions produced by more than, more than 37,000 passenger cars. We also think that this estimate is probably conservative. Um, some estimates of the benefits of trees in sequestering carbon have indicated benefits roughly five times the numbers that we use. And investing in trees also creates jobs. In Pennsylvania, CBF is involved in the Keystone 10 Million Trees Partnership which is committed to planting 10 million new trees in Pennsylvania by the end of 2025. We expect over the next year to spend roughly $2.7 million through 2022. Much of those dollars will be spent with local businesses who are gonna provide the trees, the tree shelters, the stakes, provide maintenance on these, these buffers, um, fencing livestock out of streams, which is a common practice associated with the buffers. So all of these things are creating jobs and creating an economic benefit to rural economies. The Chesapeake Bay region's farmers have shown a willingness to adopt these conservation practices, but they often lack the technical and financial resources to do so. There's no better time than now to invest in our farmers with the 2025 deadline less than four years away and the urgent need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. As noted in our report, this investment will pay dividends toward clean water, mitigating climate change, as well as helping our farmers and local rural economies. Thanks, John, back to you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Denise Stranko, our Federal Executive Director. Thank you, John. Good morning, I'm Denise Stranko, Federal Executive Director at CBF. As you all just heard from Beth, uh, many of the same conservation practices needed to implement the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint have additional benefits like reducing greenhouse gases, improving the soil health of farms, making them more resilient to the impacts of climate change and strengthening the economic health of both farmers and the communities where these practices are being implemented. We know that farmers want to implement these practices and we also know that more funding is needed. At the federal level, CBF is looking to both Congress and to the administration for leadership to ensure that farmers in the Chesapeake Bay watershed have the funding and support that they need. We are urging Congress 
to increase the overall funding available to farm bill programs and technical assistance that support agricultural conservation practices. We're hopeful that as a climate smart initiative, this will be included in a final reconciliation package passed by Congress and signed by the president. At the same time, USDA must direct more of the available dollars to the watershed and particularly to Pennsylvania. We are encouraged by recent announcements by USDA in support of climate smart practices. But now we look to the agency to take a leadership role for the Bay. We are asking USDA to use its existing authority to establish the Chesapeake Resilient Farms Initiative. This program would direct additional financial resources in the most cost-effective cost ways possible to the watershed. The agricultural funding needed between now and 2025 in Pennsylvania alone is roughly $3 billion. An infusion of funding from federal programs is just essential to getting the job done. And directing the funding to the basins where best management practices are most effective at improving water quality, it just makes sense. We have worked with partners in the environmental and ag communities in the watershed and have had many meetings with folks on the Hill and in the administration. Momentum is building. We are so happy to report that the ag secretaries in the watershed, as well as the farm bureaus in the watershed, have both sent letters to Secretary Vilsack in support of establishing this program. Finally, of course, as Congress and the administration begin the discussions on the 2023 Farm Bill, we must also focus on providing farmers the financial and technical assistance they need to be a part of the solution in the watershed. As, as has already been said by Beth, implementing these ag conservation practices will not only help us achieve the reductions necessary for the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint, but they help. They reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they imp improve climate resiliency, grow the local economy, and strengthen farms, which ultimately improves the economic outlook for farmers. We urge Congress and the administration to make this investment in the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn it back over to John and my colleagues to hear more about these practices. Thanks, Denise. Uh, first, we're gonna to go to Pennsylvania to Bill Chain. Hey, uh, thanks, John. Uh, happy to be here. Um, my name's Bill Chain, uh, last name spelled C-H-A-I-N. And I'm here to talk about Pennsylvania agriculture because I'm the program manager here for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, glad to be here, glad you folks could join and, and certainly glad to speak about Pennsylvania ag. I guess it can't be overstated how important agriculture is to our environment and the Chesapeake Bay. We have over 52,000 farms in Pennsylvania and 32,000 of those farms are in the Bay watershed. It's our farm productivity in the state, which is nationally ranked. In fact, Lancaster County is ranked seventh of all US counties in livestock and poultry sales. So it's our farm productivity that includes a lot of animal waste and commercial fertilizers matched with our hills, valleys, and numerous streams that create a real conservation challenge for the entire state. So all that to say we have an immense amount of ag conservation work to do here. Among other improvement practices like keeping soils covered above and living roots below, Pennsylvania is counting on farmers to plant trees alongside streams to control erosion, cool the water, and reduce nutrient pollution. These forested riparian buffers are climate smart and crucial to stream water quality. While the states made progress, we're still many thousands of acres behind in protecting our streams. So farmers are ready to adopt conservation practices, but need funding to help with the investment. It's a word that I heard Beth use and Denise, the word investment. Currently, both the state and federal conservation funding fall woefully short of what's necessary to make that investment with, and I do say with, family farms in improving water quality. In Pennsylvania, 
I'm sad to say, in our at our state level, we've been behind in providing funding and, and really comprehensive support for the family farmer. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation with the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and Penn State University have developed a comprehensive conservation program for agriculture. It's known as ACAP, ACAP for short, is the Agricultural Conservation Assistance Program. It's an investment in Pennsylvania agriculture, but more so it's an investment in our heritage here in Pennsylvania, our wildlife. When this program's approved by the legislature, it'll provide funding and technical expertise for farmers to install many conservation practices. And that'll be supported by their local government, their local county conservation district. So what we need to do is work together. We need those federal dollars, we need state dollars, and we need our local support with county conservation districts. Farmers are right here ready to do it. They need that investment and want that investment. So John, I appreciate being able to speak on behalf of PA. Thanks folks. Thank you, Bill. We're going next to uh, Rob Schnabel from Maryland. Morning. Uh, yes, I'm a restoration scientist leading the Bay Foundation's farm stewardship work in Maryland. Uh, when Maryland we're leading the push for regenerative agriculture through the million acre challenge. The goal, where the goal is to get half of Maryland's agriculture land, a million acres to regenerative status. While Maryland's the nationwide leader in percent of cropland planted in cover crops, there's huge room for improvement as not all cover crops are created equal. Permanent ground cover is even better than seasonal cover crops. The Bay Foundation has been promoting permanent cover and rotational grazing through the Maryland Grazers Network for over 10 years. This mentorship and technical assistance program has resulted in thousands of acres of monoculture corn fields being converted to permanent diverse ground cover. Animals grazing, rotating through these pastures is like a probiotic to the soil microbes, greatly accelerating carpet sequestration in the form of soil organic matter. This restores the soil sponge, which will reduce flooding during storm events, as well as make these farms more resilient during times of drought. Our next generation of farmers want to reduce their input costs and use natural systems to restore farmland soils for future generations. A perfect example is listed in this report um, is Open Book Farm, where forest buffers were planted along streams to reduce erosion and improve water quality, while the monoculture cornfields were converted to diverse perennial pastures for multi-species grazing, basically creating the salad bar for the animals. These young farmers raise pasture beef, pork, and poultry and grow vegetables. These goods are then direct marketed to consumers on the farm and at farmers markets to ensure they get their fair share of the food dollar, staying profitable. This farm is an important piece of the puzzle in the local economy. Federal funding was critical for this farm to transition from conventional to regenerative agriculture. Please support this, thank you. Thank you, Rob. And now to Virginia, Matt Kowalski. Thanks, John, and good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Kowalski, last name K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I. As John said, I'm the Virginia Watershed Restoration Scientist here in Virginia for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of rotational grazing and why we like rotational grazing so much. Um, to tag onto a little bit of what Rob just said, uh, it creates a perennial cover for our fields. Uh, perennial just means we've got permanent plants uh, growing year round above the ground. So that protects the soil, uh, reduces erosion. So we see less soil and nutrients leaving the field and grow, going into our streams uh, with results in less water pollution. Um, rotational grazing also creates a healthier forage. So by grazing multiple small fields, each field gets to rest during that time when it is not being grazed. That means that the plants grow taller and healthier and the root systems get deeper and healthier. When we get deep roots and healthy roots like that, we can sequester carbon into our soils. That means more soil carbon, more organic material. That increases the soil's ability to hold water when water comes. 
that makes our systems, our farms more resilient to floods because they're able to absorb that rainwater. And during droughts, the, they're able to hold water uh, from the times when we got rain. Just to give you guys an idea of the significance that this can make, 1% increase in soil carbon can hold an additional 20,000 gallons of water for every acre of farm. That's roughly equivalent to a third, to, uh, excuse me, to three quarters of an inch of rain with no runoff. More soil carbon and better soil health also equate to better nutrient cycling. So what we have in rotational grazing systems is the soil staying in place, our water staying in place, and our nutrients staying in place. So healthier forage also means less weeds. So we tend to see less herbicide use, leading to better water quality and lower cost for the farmer. We also see lower greenhouse gases from the manufacture and the use of those herbicide products. One of the other great things we like about rotational grazing is that it lowers the use of farm machinery compared to growing feed and making and feeding hay. It saves the farmer time. It saves the farmer fuel, which saves cost, but it also lowers greenhouse gas emissions because we're using those fossil fuels less to run the tractor. I mentioned that we get better nutrient cycling when we've got better soil health. We also get better nutrient distribution with rotational grazing systems. By breaking those larger fields into smaller paddocks, we get better distribution of urine and manure, which are the sources from the animal to cycle those nutrients back into the soil. That also lowers cost and it lowers greenhouse gas from the manufacturing and the use of fertilizers. By keeping more nutrients in place, we see that farmers that are using rotational grazing tend to use fewer fertilizers. One other additional benefit that we tend to see associated with rotational grazing systems is when people are putting these systems in place, they often do livestock stream exclusion practices as well. That both creates an opportunity to create a forested riparian buffer, the benefits of which Bill Chain uh, just spoke about, uh, but getting the animals out of the stream also prevents stream bank erosion, keeps the nutrients that are in their waste on the pastures and out of our streams, and it keeps the livestock healthy, clean, and safe. So in summary, rotational grazing is good for farmers, it's good for water quality, and it's great for the climate. So I'd like to wrap up with saying that lawmakers should encourage the adoption of these agricultural BMPs like rotational grazing by providing more cost share money and more funding for technical support for farmers. As an example, lawmakers had the opportunity in Virginia this year to fully fund the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program at $286 million during this legislative session. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, if you have a question, please type it in the uh, Q&A box and uh, let us know your name, your affiliation, and who you'd like to direct the question to. Uh, David Payne uh, with uh, Radio PA has a question. David, uh, can you can unmute you yourself? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, this is uh, for, for the Pennsylvania representative from the, from the Bay Foundation. You, you had mentioned um, uh, 2025 as the as the deadline for Pennsylvania to be in compliance. What specifically does the state need to do, and is there any um, is there any uh, penalty or any sanction for noncompliance? Well, John, I'll, John, I'll begin. Uh, Beth, maybe you can help back me up with the uh, penalty question. Um, but uh, Pennsylvania. Um, developed a watershed improvement plan about two years ago that uh, takes us to 2025. In that plan, um, a group of people got together. Uh, actually, I was on that committee and sat down next to a lot of farmers and others in the environmental and conservation field that uh, developed um, a set of goals 
uh, an actual number of acres to have a reduced tillage or no till, uh, a number of acres uh, by 2025 to be covered in cover crops over the winter, a huge uh, nutrient management goal to, um, to, to really reduce nitrogen and phosphorus as it's applied to soils and manage those nutrients. In addition to that, I mentioned the riparian uh, buffer. That's the, uh, let me uh, go back and say that's the forested riparian buffer. Um, in that uh, watershed improvement plan, the state um, said it specifically that they'd like to see 86,000 acres planted in Pennsylvania to protect Pennsylvania streams and water quality. So that's, those were the goals. Now, annually, we get reports on how we're doing on those goals. It's uh, somewhat the report follows of uh, that uh, annual year by some distance in order to get it right. Uh, your second part of the question was what happens to Pennsylvania if we don't make our goals? And that's um, been uh, a reality in the past. And I'm gonna pass that off to you, Beth, to. Um, project how EPA might feel about those things. Great, thanks, Bill. So one of the key features of what we call the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint is we have pollution limits, we have state-specific plans, and we have accountability. Um, EPA outlined back in 2010, some of the consequences the states could face if they don't either develop adequate plans or implement those plans over time. Some of those consequences are, are all of them are things that they can do under their existing authority under the Clean Water Act. So for example, they could crack down on existing permitted sources such as wastewater treatment plants or industrial sources that have a Clean Water Act permit. They could put more sources underneath a permit. For example, right now, mostly only large agricultural operations have a, are required to get a Clean Water Act permit. There is a provision that would allow um, smaller animal feeding operations to be permitted under certain conditions. Another tool that EPA has used in the past is redirecting grant funds. So indicating we want the states to do X, Y, and Z with the money that they give them every year. So those are some of the consequences that EPA has used in the past, some of them, and, and could use in the future to encourage compliance by the states. Thank you, Beth. Uh, we have a question from Mark Heller. Uh, Mark, do you want to ask a question? Unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, I wondered maybe if you all could talk a little bit about the USDA's, uh, these pilot projects for uh, climate smart uh, commodities where they're looking for people to, to, uh, to try innovative things and they can measure the climate impacts and so forth of that. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the potential for that in the watershed. And I wonder if the foundation is looking to participate in some way. Beth, do you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, great question. We are. We were really excited by that announcement from USDA. Basically, they're putting on the table $1 billion uh, to these various pilot projects from one size goes from, I think, 250000 up to $5 million, And then some projects could go from $5 million up to $100 million. Um, we are definitely looking at that and we're going to reach out to our local partners. The, the, the benefits are that it the projects would include implementation of these climate smart practices, which as we've all talked about, include many of the things that we've committed to do to implement as part of our cleanup for the Chesapeake Bay. It also would require a monitoring verification provision and quantification of the greenhouse gas benefits of whatever is implemented. And then the last component that USDA is looking for is to link um, these farms with markets. So whether you are a supplier that wants to tout to your customers that your produce was, was produced in an environmentally or a climate smart friendly way, um, there's lots of opportunities. So we're, we're looking at it. Um, we're really excited by um, the investment from USDA in this because we see the multiple benefits of, of implementing these practices. So stay tuned. All right, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? John, may I add on to Beth's answer? Um, Certainly. To Mark about the climate 
um, climate smart farming. So, uh, Mark, I have it right, don't I, Mark? Um, the, um, the, the thing I'd like to add is that uh, farmers are ready for, um, for this. Uh, uh, many farmers that I spend time with and work with uh, are implementing the, the kinds of agriculture I heard both Rob and Matt talk about in, uh, with regenerative practices. Sometimes they don't often come out and say, well, it's all climate change, but we do in Pennsylvania experience um, larger uh, events where we have uh, two, three, four, even as many as seven inches of rainfall in an hour. Uh, and then uh, consequently, we'll go for uh, extended periods of drought. So, so using these regenerative practices, um, improving infiltration rate, like Matt said, with uh, improving organic matter and covering the soils with, uh, with a diverse cover crop, like Rob said, uh, are, is what we see happening and what we see farmers really wanting to do. So this, this program that the federal government's putting out is a right time type program. It's, it's, uh, it's meeting a need and farmers are, are interested. Um, and, and, and just wanted to add that to the, to the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I do not see any additional questions. Uh, if you have a question, type it in now or let me know. Um, otherwise, we're just gonna wrap it up. And I appreciate your all, you all attending. And if you need any more information, feel free to reach out to me or to any of our state media folks. Thanks again.